Chris Aldo with Paul Macklin. Um, Paul is an associate professor, professor at Indiana University in the School of Intelligent Systems Engineering. He's the founder of PhysiCell, uh, which is a really exciting open source computational tool for multicellular systems biology. Paul has developed this tool to be a cross-platform parallelized C++ open source code that can do multi-substrate diffusion and large-scale agent-based model simulations in 3D tissue. And it's been used and applied across uh, numerous problems such as cancer biology, tumor formation, immunology, nanotechnology, and even COVID-19 currently. So it's a very exciting platform. Uh, so Paul's going to start off today by giving us a talk about the platform and introducing us to it and explaining the different aspects of it. And then he's also going to be giving a tutorial later today that'll be taking you through how you might actually want to use the platform. So if you're interested in creating your own agent-based model and curious about a platform, this should be something definitely to check out. So I'll let Paul go ahead and share his screen. If at any point anyone has questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, you are also welcome to raise your hand at the end and we'll be just like before posting all the questions that you ask in the Google document and we'll let Paul uh, answer them at the end. So thank you very much, Paul, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Adrian, for the invitation and the really uh, overly generously kind uh, introduction. Uh, I, I don't feel anywhere near as cool as what you just said. Um, it's just, it's a great honor to be here with, with friends and, and people whose work I really look up to. And it's really come to be, I think, well, I guess if you do something twice, it's become a tradition. So I guess this meeting is now a tradition. Uh, so it's very, very exciting. Um, and it's been great to follow some of the wonderful talks this morning that have already done a great job of introducing agent-based modeling. I'm gonna elaborate on that a little bit further and then give kind of a, a brief introduction to what's in our platform and then give some uh, some recent examples of modeling, uh, which has actually been done with a lot of collaborators in this room here. So this is a, really a fun opportunity. Uh, so something that interests us, and I think a lot of us uh, in the room here is looking at how in, in biology, you know, biology is complex, but if you really distill it down, the things that cells do you know, there's like a handful of things. They, they can grow, they can divide, they can die, they can stick to each other, they can push each other around, say viscoelastically, like in Sicily's talk this morning, they can crawl around in tissues, they can secrete chemical factors, they can consume those chemical factors or sample the environment around them, they can run around and eat each other, so like predation, and they can also differentiate, like change type. And of course, there are a lot of things they can do too, but these are kind of the key behaviors. And somehow, of these very simple, individual cell behaviors, we get complex systems that emerge. You can have uh, emergence of really complex spatial temporal patterns. You can get population dynamics like in Lissette's talk yesterday uh, of these ecosystems. You can get uh, tissues that self-organize and perform very specialized roles in larger organisms. And so one question that's, you know, I think very interesting is how do you go from very simple individual cell behaviors uh, working in networks of cells communicating with one another to form and sustain these kinds of structures. And so whoop, somehow I went up to my very last page. Um, and so really this is a multicellular systems problem. You, this you know, image you've seen over and over and over again, in particular in cancer, but really cancer is a multi-scale complex system of interconnected systems and processes. You have the single cell behaviors that we just discussed about, uh, a moment ago. The cells communicate with each other, not just chemically by diffusing chemicals, but also mechanically and physically. They can sense contact. They can sense mechanical stresses and strains compression. Uh, there are physical constraints in these systems. Uh, cells need oxygen and glucose to live and survive and, and thrive. And uh, those have to come from somewhere. So you have uh, diffusion driven limits on where cells can be. And of course, physical barriers are also uh, constraints. And then these can form systems of systems that you have uh, say different immune cell types, which are already complex systems interacting with another to become an immune system. And that is a complex system. Now in normal tissue, somehow all this comes into a balance and you get a kind of a homeostatic state in a nice, you know, well-functioning, well-maintained tissue. But in diseases like cancer, parts of these systems become dysregulated, they fall out of balance. And traditionally treatments are very reductionist and they target individual parts of these species. Go cancer, uh, go target the invading you know, uh, weird cell type, go target inflammation, go target uh, cell birth and death of uh, you know, the cancer cells that are dividing too much with a chemotherapy agent to try to kill them off. But like we know with any nonlinear complex system, 
tinkering with one part of that complex system can have unexpected side effects as they kind of percolate through that multi-scale complex web. And so really to understand cancer, we can't just focus reductionist wise on one cell type, one pathway, uh, but we have to look at the entire system. And so looking this into the multicellular context, we'll kind of call this multicellular systems biology to study the biology of how cells work together and communicate and interact. And of course, we don't want to just understand these systems. We want to control them and steer them back towards a healthy state. And so that's where you move from multicellular systems biology to multicellular systems engineering to apply that, uh, that knowledge towards controlling the multicellular system. And then an analogy I like to make when thinking about agent-based modeling and biology is to think of biology as a play. And the microenvironment is the stage, you know, the, the you know, the, the extracellular matrix, like you saw in some of the earlier talks today, uh, the chemical things that are like oxygen and signaling factors that are diffusing through the environment, that's like the stage. And then the cells are the actors that you place upon that stage. And each cell follows their own script. Of the, of, of each cell actor follows his own script. Uh, but in cancer biology in particular, uh, the scripts change with the scene. You know, they're context dependent. Uh, the cells aren't just shouting out into the audience, the actors are talking to each other. So the cell-cell communication is very, very important. There's a dialogue. Uh, then these are naughty actors. They can tear up the stage and remodel it at will. This is like tissue remodeling. And in cancer in particular, they have a horrible tendency to go off script and ad lib. That would be like mutations and evolution. And as scientists, what we get to do with a biological experiment is we get to watch the play and guess the script. And that's the kind of the core of, of science here. And so our goal is to try to watch the, the play over and over and over again and come up with hypotheses of what that unknown script is. And then as clinicians and engineers, we want to modify the script so the cells start doing what they should do and come back to an orderly play. And so cells, uh, and so Heiko actually talked a lot about this yesterday from what I understand, you know, that scientists use models of a broad variety uh, to detangle these kinds of complex systems, you know, animal models, in vitro models, uh, bio 3D printed models, engineered models, lab on a chip. Uh, and here, we're gonna use mathematical and computational models to detangle these systems like you've been seeing throughout this workshop, which has been just wonderful. Um, so agent-based modeling is a particular paradigm that can be very ideal for these types of complex multicellular systems, because in this kind of a paradigm, the cells are software agents that all are able to move and live in a virtual tissue environment according to whatever rules you give them. And so it kind of is helpful, I think, to start, you know, thinking just briefly, you know, what is a discrete model? And we're all, I think, you know, particularly familiar with continuum models, that they have a continuous variable that can take any value, uh, you know, on, on the real line, for example, and they're continuously usually differentiable. Classic example would be Fisher's equation, where you have a density of cells that move in space and time. Uh, you use like a diffusion term to model the motility, the random motility of the cells, and then say logistic birth death term to model the birth and death of that. And you can model that and analyze it in, in very nice ways. Discrete models, on the other hand, tend to focus on distinct individuals with take discrete values. It can be like a Boolean model, uh, take a true or false value, or an integer model that can take like say one cell, two cells, three. So you don't have the entire real nine, you're gonna have discrete, you know, uh, possible values. And the classic example would be if, say, if you're going to model a population X of, of cells with a Poisson birth death process, it's like kind of, some kind of rate R. So each individual in that model, between now T and T plus delta T later, there'd be a probability of that cell undergoing a birth event, which is a discrete event, which is going to be your rate times your delta T for your probability. And then if you go and look across the population of X cells, each one of those has that probability of birth. And so the expected change in your cell population would be R delta T times the number of cells. Now, if you take delta T as you go down to zero, you can actually arrive back at your classical you know, ODE model of exponential growth. So it's very nice that you can actually convert these very nicely uh, to continuum models as you get enough individuals, but discrete models work well even when you have only a few individuals. So you don't have to meet that continuum hypothesis. So it's like a nice generalization. An agent-based model then is a particular kind of a discrete model where you, you focus on the individual cells as your agents. Sometimes you call it individual-based model, sometimes you call it a cell-based model. And you'll often combine that discrete representation of cells with a continuum representation of the microenvironment, say a PDE for a diffusion of oxygen or glucose. You put those together and you'll call that then a hybrid discrete continuum model. And that's been really uh, something that, that Sandy Anderson's group in particular has been uh, very important in highlighting at, at Moffat there. Now with agent-based modeling, uh, it's, you can use what's called object-oriented programming where every individual cell 
uh, you define it as a class and then it is an object. And the nice thing then is that each object has its member data, it would be like the cell characteristics and the methods, which would be the cell rules for things like proliferation, division, uh, and movement. And so the cell agent-based models are actually a little bit closer to the biology because you can focus on choosing what are the data that are important to my problem. Those become your cell variables. What do you need to kind of measure and track? And then you kind of say, based on my observations of watching cells, watching the play, I have an idea of what the script is. I have hypotheses in the cell rules and start uh, implementing those as the individual rules of your cell agents. The typical agent-based model programming flow kind of goes like this. You start off by you know, doing some bookkeeping. You read your parameter values. Then you're gonna set the stage. You set up your microenvironment to define all the diffusing substrates, the diffusion coefficients, things like that, set up your solvers. Uh, then you're kind of going to do your casting call. You, you set up your cell definition. Say, I have tumor cells defined, fibroblasts defined, endothelial cells defined. I'm going to kind of define all of them. And then I'm going to place my cell actors on that stage. So they're going to kind of place them in the initial positions. And then you're going to start the play. You start time. You say at every single little chunk of time, you're going to update the microenvironment by solving, say, all your diffusion solvers. Then you're going to go through all of your cells and update their states with whatever rules you have. And then you're going to move them around and change their positions, advance time, and then just keep going over and over and over again. Update the environment, update the cells, update the environment, update the cells. Just basically kind of a, an operator splitting type of technique. So uh, we won't go into too much, but we do have a review article available, and we'll make sure to share these slides uh, with, with Adrian and distribute them. Uh, but really, you can look at both lattice-bound models, where cells can move left, right, up, down. They, they, define, they can occupy uh, very discrete sites. And uh, if you increase the resolution, you can start modeling some morphology mechanics. So that'd be like uh, moving from a cellular automaton model <clears throat> to a cellular POTS model. Then on the flip side, you can say, you know, we're not really, uh, we don't want to restrict cell position. So we're going to treat it more like a free body diagram and model the, uh, say, the size and position of individual cells. And that'd be an off lattice uh, center based model. And then if you want to say, well, we really do need cell morphology or shape, then you say, well, what if I kind of break that cell agent out down to sub agents? and have little tiny pieces of cell and then kind of have them stick together in some kind of a mechanical way, that would be a subcellular element model. And so where physicist cell fits into this is that we're an off lattice model. So we aren't restricted uh, by having a bunch of identical cells in discrete positions. We can model mechanics. Uh, and we have the spatial resolution of one agent per cell. So that is uh, you know, some kind of a, a trade-off between efficient and not quite as detailed as say a you know, subcellular element model or cellular POTS model. Although there are some tricks, right? You can, for example, use a bigger agent to model chunks of tissue, or you can use smaller agents to model cell parts and just come up with extra rules for that. So you can actually approximate with this framework uh, subcellular element models. And then we bundle with the microenvironment with uh, diffusion solvers to make it a discrete, you know, hybrid continuum approach. And then you can always add more detailed rules to the individual agents to make it multi-scale. For example, coupling with systems of ODEs or Boolean networks to uh, make it multi-scale. So um, kind of give you some of the methodologic detail. Uh, we have a finite volume method called BioFBM, which we designed for solving vectors of diffusion reaction equations. Realizing that in biology, most of the work we're doing is reaction diffusion. Sometimes you do need to do advection, but you know, most models are in lower flow tissues, so we don't need to worry about those terms. So we built this from, kind of from the ground up to be tailored to biology to not solve every possible PDE under the sun, but to be specialized to reaction diffusion equations, solve them pretty quickly uh, using OpenMP parallelization. It's cross-platform, works on Linux, Windows, uh, OS X, um, you know, lots of platforms. And a second order accurate in space, first order accurate in time, and numerically stable, and the scales very nicely. In particular, we found that uh, increasing from one PDE to five to 10 doesn't increase your cost by a factor of five to 10, but rather for a factor of like two to three. So it becomes pretty scalable in, in 2D uh, and in 3D. So that was published in bioinformatics. And one key part of this is that we had uh, cell-based sources and sinks located throughout the environment that can approximate cells, but with static positions. So the next thing we added was physicist cell, where we took that bio beyond that stage framework with the static cell sources and sinks, and we added the biology in. So we added you know, off-lattice positions, sizes, uh, the basic cell processes like cycling, death, motility, secretion, and then it gave you an ability to add custom data and custom functions on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. So you can really model the heterogeneity of cancer coupled with the microenvironment. Uh, so here, actually, I'm going to walk you through a quick example. Here's uh, an example of competition in tumors. So in this example, um, 
every cell is given basically an aggressiveness parameter, uh, an oncogene, if you will, uh, or oncoprotein ranging from blue, which is like not very aggressive, to yellow, which is super aggressive. And there's a whole continuum of values and each cell has its own individual value of that parameter. And so here you can see a kind of a salt and pepper initial distribution with an opening into the tumor so you can kind of see the internal dynamics. So the basic rules here is that uh, the more aggressive the tumor cell is, the more capable it is of entering the cell cycle and being a little bit faster in proliferation. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, the environment has constraints. So we have oxygen diffusion from the outside in. Every tumor cell is consuming oxygen, which means that the farther you get into that tumor, the deeper in, the lower the oxygen level gets. And so proliferation is going to be proportional to how aggressive the cell is and how much oxygen it has. It's like a proxy of energy availability. And then if the, uh, the oxygen level drops too low, you'll get necrosis, which is like an oxygen starved death, uh, an energy starved death. So look as this tumor grows, you're seeing the yellow cells are proliferating faster. So you're getting these little patches of, of aggressive clones uh, emerging. And then at the center, you can see that uh, you have the necrotic core emerging. And here, because of the mechanics, that the necrotic cells are shrinking but sticking together, that's mechanically unstable, and get the formation of like a little network of chasms in the necrotic core, which is actually something we see in in vitro organoid models. And here you can see that we have competition, but no new sources of mutation. So this actually becomes more and more homogeneous over time as the yellow clones start to win. So there's an example, and actually a 2D version of this is bundled in every copy of physicist cell. And you can actually get a 3D version by turning off the immune part of the 3D tumor immune model. And if you look at this hyperlink here, you can actually try this model online and play with it without compiling physicist cell. So, uh, you know, the main parts of physicist cell is we have the microenvironment stage modeled with physics, uh, with BioFBM. Then you have the cell definitions, which are like the types of players. And then you have the individual cell agents, which are instances of the cell uh, uh, classes. And you can start uh, then modifying the phenotype uh, to really get at the script. And so here, we, you know, our modeling paradigm is that uh, we know what the basic processes are, and we're trying to provide kind of a standardized platform for that, so that everyone doesn't have to do their own model of cell growth or division or motility. Although you certainly can replace it with your own if you want to. Instead, you can focus more on the biology here to say, you know, I want to uh, make a rule that says the cells vary cell cycle entry with oxygenation. Well, you can focus on programming the phenotype and then saying that that sets a parameter that triggers how often you, you, you enter the standardized cell cycle model in the pl platform. Likewise, birth, death mechanics, you know, with, you know, bias random migration is already built in. So just as an example here, uh, you can look at a, a cargo delivery system. We have three different cell types. Director cells are green. They secrete a director signal that diffuses into the environment. The workers are, I'm sorry, then there's cargo cells that are blue. And all they do is first they just kind of sit there and they secrete a cargo signal that diffuses into the environment and says, I'm a package and I need to be picked up for delivery. Then the red cells are kind of like your UPS workers here uh, or DHL in Europe, I suppose, uh, or rail post. But they are, uh, when they're undocked, they are seeking cargo. So they do a biased random migration of the cargo signal test for mechanical contact, say, have I run into anybody? And if so, they form a spring-like adhesion, and that triggers a change in the cargo cells. So the contact-based communication, the cargo cells stop, stop secreting their cargo signal. And then the red workers say, oh, I'm docked. That triggers a change in their behavior, and they start doing chemotaxis towards the director's signal. So then these, basically, they have this cargo attached by string, uh, by a spring-like adhesion. They wander up the migration gradient towards the director's signal and drop off their cargo and uh, then return the search. So this actually is a multicellular circuit that gives cargo delivery. Um, you can kind of see this in, I think today in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the live demo of this model, but you can try this yourself. And I have some suggested exercises where uh, you kind of go and build this model up gradually. Say, first, just do the cargo and workers only and see what happens. Then add the full model and see what happens. Then modify some of the properties of the workers and see how that changes the distribution of where they put the cargo. So that'd be, you know, something I suggest as an exercise to explore uh, one of these agent-based models without necessarily having to run and download the full code. Uh, what I'd like to focus on now is some recent modeling examples, which just give kind of a sampling of the types of things we can do in this platform uh, and the type of work we're trying to really make possible for other people. So for the first example is about tumor parenchyma interactions and micrometastases. And this is work that was led by Yalfe Wing. Uh, by the way, he is graduating this year and will be looking for a postdoc, and he's a fantastic student, so we're just very happy to plug the wonderful work that he's done. And this is uh, recently published 
the scientific report. So this will be at this hyperlink down here. So one question we have you know, asked is, you know, when you have a micrometastasis or really any tumor arriving in a tissue, how does the surrounding normal tissue, the parenchyma, get out of the way to clear space for that growing tumor? And in particular, what happens if that tissue kind of fights back by imposing mechanical constraints on that tumor? And so we wrote a, a really basic model that had uh, biomechanical feedbacks that uh, the parenchyma is imparting forces on the tumor that basically acts like a, a mechanical pressure that compresses the tumor cells. And so as a basic you know, uh, feedback, we said that if the tumor experiences too much compression, it downregulates its cell cycle entry, it's its proliferation. But the tumor is also interacting with the parenchyma, that it is also imparting a force on the, on the parenchyma. And so we used a really basic plastoelastic model um, where over short term, uh, every, L, every little piece of parenchyma has kind of like an anchoring point and it remembers its relaxed position. And so if you displace it from that last uh, position, you're deforming that little bit of tissue and there's an elastic restorative force that tries to put it back and that in turn imposes a force back on the tumor. But we know that if you leave any biological material and kind of displace it for a very long time, there could be a plastic reorganization where that resting position relaxes to the current position. And so uh, that can basically relieve the compression being imposed upon the tumor. The other thing is that we know that a lot of tissues can't really tolerate a large deformation. And so it was a really basic model of tissue disruption. We said, well, uh, if the elastic deformation is strong and fast and the cell, that little bit of liver tissue has been deformed too much, we're gonna basically have it die off. And that's how the tumor can clear out some space, uh, depending upon the balance of all these processes. And so here's an example of this running in a large chunk of tumor, uh, sorry, of liver. The yellow cells are the tumor cells that are undergoing a high mechanical pressure and they get pressure arrested. And if you take a cross section across the tumor, you can see that actually the peak pr uh, pressure is not at the very edge of the tumor, but a little bit farther in. And then that pressure gets relieved as you go towards the necrotic core because those necrotic cores shrinking is like a pressure release, at least a mechanical pressure release. Now fluid pressure is different, but that's not the focus here. Then if you look outside the tumor, outside that boundary, you can see that the deformation is at a maximum right at the tumor uh, parenchyma interface, and then it dissipates actually pretty far into the tissue. You can try this model yourself online and uh, you know, play with the different parameters. And if you look at a histologic section, you can see evidence of this. So look at the liver tissue right here near the boundary. You can see that it's been compressed in the direction of expansion and stretched kind of uh, tangent, you know, per parallel to the surface. That really shows that the closer you are to the tumor, the more the compression is, the more deformation is kind of stretching that tissue to be parallel to the interface. And that effect gets less and less as you go into the normal tissue. So you can see that dissipation effect. Uh, one interesting thing here is that actually this framework is with these really basic assumptions is enough to give you tumor dormancy. That if you have a large elastic restorative force in the tissue, so it's like a young elastic tissue and a very slow plastic reorganization and that it can tolerate that deformation long enough, you can actually put enough pressure back onto the tumor to compress the whole thing and get a dormant tumor that either stops growing or grows super, super slowly over long periods of time. And so you can basically get an encapsulated tumor, uh, a micrometastasis that's probably gonna stay subclinical and never get detected. But here's the interesting thing. If suppose something comes along as a perturbation and changes your tissue, say an injury or illness that might reduce the elasticity of your tissue or uh, reduce your tissue's tolerance to that deformation, then that previously tumor, tor dormant tumor can be released and, and reawaken and start growing into that tissue and taking it over. Whereas the control case of no perturbation can go another 90 days with a, basically in a completely arrested state. So small uh, mechanical perturbations of your surrounding tissue could be enough to reawaken a tumor, even without complex signaling between them. Uh, another example is looking at cancer immune contact interactions. So if you take that, that tumor model that I showed you just a moment ago when introducing physis cell, let's add one more component. These red cells are gonna be a basic model of like effector T cells. And what they're gonna do is they're going to perform a biased random migration towards the tumor of say some chemical you know, inflammatory marker uh, or signal released by the tumor. And they're gonna do a biased random migration up the tumor, test for mechanical contact, and if so, form an adhesion. And then they're gonna sample the immunogenicity, immunogenicity of that tumor cell. So the more yellow cells, we're gonna say that's more mutated and more immunogenic. So that, 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 tumor, that immune cell has a greater probability of killing off that tumor cell. And if so, great. Let's go, induces death in the tumor cell and moves on looking for another target. But if it fails, 
and say the small chunk of time from T to T plus delta T is going to keep trying to kill that tumor cell. And you know, the more immunogenic, the greater the probability of success, but it's going to keep trying. So we have one more probability that says it's like, you know, a, a mean lifetime of that adhesion that's, that kind of governs how long that immune cell keeps trying to kill off its target before it gives up and releases. And you can kind of expect there's going to be a trade-off, right? That uh, the longer an immune cell stays stuck to a particular cell, the greater probability it has of killing it off, but at a trade-off of saying that it might be missing some better target other, you know, somewhere nearby. So if you run this model, and I think a lot of you have probably already seen this one, uh, the results kind of happily go in and find target and start munching away the tumor and uh, continue to go up the chemical gradient looking for more and more uh, tumors, uh, tumor cells. But because it's stochastic and performing a random walk, it, it does leave a few cells behind. Now in a well-mixed ODE system, this would preferentially kill all the yellow cells and this would probably result in a fairly well-killed tumor uh, if the specificity is high enough. But in the stochastic spatial model, you can see that a few cells are left behind and we've actually opened up a lot of room for competition. Now the yellow cells actually start repopulating the tumor and coming back at a vengeance before the poor hapless immune cells can, uh, can get a glimpse of what's going on and start going back into the tissue and chasing them down. So here we can see that the stochasticity of the 3D can make a big impact. But you know, one simulation is basically a fun demo. And so to do the science, we need to start exploring the parameter space of like model design, of, of therapeutic design. And so we said, you know, what happens if we pick, take three parameters, say, you know, how biases our migration, attachment rate, uh, how easily can form attachments and how long they stay attached. Very each one of those is low, medium, high. So that's three to the three or 27 parameter sets. Stochastic models, we've got to run, you know, at least 10 replicates per parameter set. That's a lot of simulations. And you know, back when we wrote this model, that would take about a weekend per simulation. So you're looking at a year and a half computing. That's clearly infeasible. And so we worked with Argonne National Lab to do high throughput computing, to run all 270 simulations on a cluster at the same time. Uh, I won't really go into the detailed results here, but we found you know, an interesting nonlinear behavior that if the, two, if the immune cells had very, very random migration, it actually acted more like that well-mixed ODE model where they were able to, to mix with the population and not leave yellow cells behind and actually got a much better cell killing than kind of an intermediate one. Or if they went very deterministic on cell migration, they were able to just very efficiently hop from target to heart, target to target to target and also kill off more cells. And it turns out that our initial parameter set of kind of 50, 50, you know, deterministic or random was like the optimally stupidest possible strategy we could pick for, for our immune cells. So that's something we don't think we really would have known a priori just by looking at the model, but the three, this uh, investigation helped us to expose that, that behavior. Um, now, if you want to increase the number of parameters you explore, things get interesting, right? So we said, what happens if we take the three same three parameters and add another three parameters? This becomes like a six dimensional design space. This, uh, this is too much to explore by brute force, even on clusters. And so we changed into a kind of a cascading set of problems to investigate. So the first one says, what does it take to achieve cancer control? What parameter combinations allow you to set your final cancer cell population and final does not exceed your initial population? Then you look and say, what does it take to get that cancer into remission to cut the number of cells by 90% or cut them by 90%? And then finally, the kind of the more classic optimization was it take to minimize the number of, of final uh, cancer cells. And so what you can do is to take one of those scenarios and turn it into a binary classification problem. You take your six dimensional design space and classify each point in that space as either meeting your design goal, achieve cancer control, or failing to meet the design goal, not achieving cancer control. And so this basically becomes a true false binary classification. And then what you can do is you can perform active learning on high throughput, on, on, uh, high throughput computing. So pick you know, a thousand random parameter sets, for example, and for each parameter set, run 20 replicates because it's stochastic, we want to be really careful and classify all those and come up with kind of like the mean classification for each point that you just sampled. Then instead of running another random set of uh, simulations, you use active learning. You say, I'm gonna pick my simulations to uh, refine the decision boundary. And so this, it turns out, gave us a thousand fold improvement in the speed of uh, searching our design space. And as a bonus, we got the Gini coefficients from this binary classifier to help us rank the importance of the parameters in making that decision of classifying as true or false, for example. And then we, you know, uh, we can find that this model gives a broad variety of behaviors depending on the parameter values. So you know, this really has you know, a very complex topology to the design space. 
But because we were able to combine active learning with high throughput computing and an agent-based model, we were able to not just you know, brute force explore, but really get a sense of the topology of our design space. Uh, and also we were able to interpret the parameters of the Gini coefficients. It turns out that even this really simple model that all is all, not looking at complex signaling or anything like that, nothing fancy, just contact interactions was able to identify that the most important parameter to uh, successfully killing off a tumor or not uh, was how long the immune cells can last. Uh, basically how many times can they kill before they wear out? So this kind of relates to T cell exhaustion and your ability to kind of keep replenishing your army. And that was actually the most important parameter uh, that just popped out the contact interactions. So uh, if you want to try this model yourself, you can go to this link here on, on NanoHub and, and try out the model and vary some of the parameters and, and hopefully have some fun with it. Uh, as a third example, uh, this really ties into a lot of people who are here on the call today. We've been doing some community-driven work uh, to develop a, a SARS-CoV-2 tissue simulator. And this work in my lab is uh, led by postdoc Michael Goetz uh, and is work done in collaboration with all the wonderful scientists in this room, in particular Adrian and, and, and Morgan and some of the others on the call here today. So we're really grateful to have formed a large coalition to rapidly and iteratively build up this model. Um, so the idea here is that we want to kind of rapidly prototype, you know, build a model, see how it does, talk to our community of experts, say what's missing, what goes in the next version, communicate what we learned with an open source preprint, and then just go on to the next iteration. And, you know, we went through multiple phases. You know, the first phase of the model uh, back in March, 2020 is just to build this community. We put out in our lab a few very basic prototypes to kind of get the ball rolling. And then the community self-organized into sub teams, in particular, Adriana Morgan worked on the immune sub team to say, what are the immune cell roles? And so by phase two, we took a step back and let the community define and drive the science of the project. And we played more of a supporting role of doing technical support and helping to make sure that all the pieces work together and were compatible. And so the version three model uh, rapidly added uh, an agent-based model of the tissue immune responses. The version four model added a lymphatic compartment so you could have cell trafficking back and forth from an immune compartment, uh, as well as uh, interferon signaling. Then the version five model was just, just about to come out added neutralizing antibodies and bystander effects. Uh, so we can kind of show you the, you know, the, how the prototype moved along. The first model, kind of as an overnight proof of concept, we just took this agent modeling platform and by the next day, we added a basic model of, of one virus particle landing in the center, sticking to a, hell, to a cell, going inside and starting to replicate, and then releasing virus particles as a diffusing substrate that goes out, and that can then start infecting other cells. So you see that we're colored this epithelial tissue uh, from blue as uninfected to yellow. So it's basically according to viral load. And then the higher the viral load, we had a really basic model that said that the, the more the viral load, the greater the probability of a death event in that cell. So you can see how the waves of you know, intensity kind of propagate out. And then you have the stochastic death events that really focus in on the center. Uh, the version two model started adding in community uh, feedback and said, well, you know, that's great, but virus particles are landing randomly in your tissue. So we started adding a random seeding of the virus particles and we changed some of the parameters on the sharpness of the interface of how the virus particles diffuse in the environment and added a, uh, a receptor trafficking model to more precisely, more mechanistically model cell virus entry into the cells. And so now we see, you know, lots of little foci of infection that grow locally and then start propagating through the tissue and merging and, and unfortunately wiping out the tissue because it's like a model of an immunocompromised patient. We don't even have an immune model yet. So this is you know, unchecked COVID-19 and someone who's immunocompromised. Then the third model is really where the community started taking over and started adding things like uh, these green cells are resident macrophages that scour through the tissue and patrol and look for any dead cells, like say one killed by a virus, and then they activate and start secreting inflammatory markers that then recruit in neutrophils and effector T cells. So the, the T cells will be the red ones that come in. And uh, basically leveraging some of our earlier code, we were able to take that effector T cell model and have it now go and hunt down infected cells and start munching them down. And so you'll see that now we have neutrophils in, the blue ones, and then finally, you're gonna see uh, red uh, effector T cells that are going in and, and preferentially attacking the infected cells. So there we have you know, a rapid uh, improvement in the capabilities. Uh, the version four model at the lymphatic compartment, uh, really showing some leadership from Adrian and Tarun, uh, who I think might also be on this call. And so there we had immune cell trafficking back and forth that now immune cells, when they're activated, leave the spatial resolved tissue, go to the lymph node where an ODE network of models 
is uh, modeling the immune expansion. And then those cells can come back into your tissue and start killing things. The other thing we added was an interferon signal where infected cells can secrete an interferon that basically acts like an early warning. And so that will reach uninfected cells and they will start to slow down uh, things like uh, RNA uh, processes so they can slow down replication of the virus. So this, you see here, we take you know, the model without, um, without the interferon processes and kind of skip forward. You know, the whole tissue, even with the immune cells working very, very hard, uh, still gets completely destroyed. And if you now start adding just a low level interferon signaling, um, you know, I'm gonna skip forward just a little bit, but you can see that um, the degradation, the destruction of the tissue and the infection still proceeds, but it's much, much slower now. So you can see where an interferon uh, treatment might be a good way to slow things down. And now if you increase it by a factor of 10, uh, you can see that by the end of the simulation, there's even more tissue surviving, although it's not quite enough to fight the infection. So part of our feedback says, what are we missing? Well neutralizing antibodies, which is the way, you know, the major mechanism of uh, immunity after immunization. And so uh, we added also fibrosis, uh, actually Ford Fasip uh, in particular was leading that in Mohammed uh, Islam. Um, but in the ongoing work, actually this is a fresh result from just last night, you start adding now neutralizing antibodies. So the, uh, the lymph node is starting to secrete and pump out antibodies once the immune cells are poured in. And you know you do get a lot of destruction of the initially infected tissue, but eventually you actually get you can completely clear the virus. And so these blue cells are the you know they're they're living in a wasteland. <laughs> they got destroyed, but there is a lot of living tissue nearby. And now if you were to lace and you know basically restart this tissue like another patch of tissue, uh, now you would have the antibodies present and the virus wouldn't get a foothold. So we can model basically now that immunization process. And this is just about to be released, and we expect to kind of wrap up this project and put out a paper uh, this fall. So uh, one last example, and then I think we'll have some time for some questions. I wanna talk about some hypoxia work, which I think ties in nicely to earlier parts of today's session. And this is uh, read, uh, led by uh, Aver uh, Rocha in uh, collaboration with Johns Hopkins University, particularly uh, Nesh and, uh, and then Daniel Gilks' lab over there. And so we know that in cancer, like you've seen you know, before, that the cells you know, proliferate and as they grow and kind of fill up the space, consume the oxygen, they can outstrip their oxygen supply by blood vessels. And so the farther you get from a blood vessel, you get decreasing oxygen to regions of hypoxia or low oxygen. And then you get far enough away, you'll get regions of necrosis. And so you can see this in like a histologic section of a tumor. You have a nice, happy proliferating region of tumor with a necrotic core in the center where you just have not been able to keep up. But if you have a few major blood vessels coming in, that can kind of support a little micro pocket of, of, of cell survival and proliferation, like a tumor core. And so Danielle's lab came up with a really ingenious system because you know she was very interested in studying, you know, what do hypoxic cells do and how do they escape? And can we look at what hypoxic cells are doing after they leave hypoxic zones? Well, usually you can't stain in any way. You can stain for a cell that says, are you hypoxic right now? Uh, but she made a novel marker system that basically says that all the tumor cells start off red fluorescent. But if you put them in the hypoxic conditions, then hypoxia inducible factors like HIF1 alpha build up in that cell and they basically do self gene editing. They will sniff out the red fluorescent gene, which allows the a green fluorescent gene to start lighting up and you get a permanent color change to green. So red cells have never been hypoxic. Green cells are either currently hypoxic or have been hypoxic at some point in history long enough to change their gene. And so this gives you a really great kind of way to track who has done what and where they go. And so if you look in the cross section of tumor, you can see you know, the outermost region that's well oxygenated. Cells have never experienced hypoxia yet, so they're red. Go deeper in, you have these green cells uh, that have been hypoxic adapted. Go further back cell, you might find some cells that didn't quite manage to escape hypoxic zones. So they, they become uh, then necrotic here in the, in the backside by just say tunnel assay. So the question that we asked, which is very similar to questions that we saw earlier today is, you know, what are the rules of hypoxic cell motility? Uh, several years ago, I went to a conference with biologists and asked every one of them saying, you know, suppose in like a thought experiment that you take a cell with a hypoxic adapted phenotype. It's, it's maybe a little bit less proliferative. It increases migration. It's moving up oxygen gradients. It's trying to escape those bad conditions. So suppose that hypoxic cell is successful, that it, it leaves hypoxic conditions and goes to a region with higher oxygenation. What happens? Will that cell resume its old normoxic program and go back to its old behavior? Will it permanently keep its new 
hypoxic phenotype, or will it do something in between where it kind of takes some time to revert back to its old behavior? And so I asked, you know, like a pop, you know, like a random sampling of biologists, and I got basically their answers were the entire right half of the real line of how long it takes for a cell to resume its old program. There's some that said the time is zero, so they instantaneously change back to old behavior. There are others who gave basically infinity that said they never changed their their old behavior, and then we got pretty much any value in between. So we built a model uh, that allowed us to kind of ask this type of thought experiment, saying, you know, we're going to add a, a hypoxic uh, persist phenotypic persistence time that says that when a hypoxic cell with kind of the green, you know, phenotype leaves a hypoxic region, so uh, no longer hypoxic conditions, there's going to have a random variable that says, you know, that there's a probability of returning to its old pro uh, its old normoxic you know, program, you know, slowing down migration and then going back to normal proliferation. And that's like a random process. So uh, it will have like a mean duration. And so um, we built a basic model of the color change and that we kind of did this model of the red green switch based upon hypoxic conditions. So we can model the color changes and try to match it up a little bit to the experiments. Um, and then we added the you know, bias random migration up to the oxygen gradients, which is, uh, and then had uh, oxygen and proliferate and pressure based uh, cell proliferation. But then on top of that, oh, I forgot to mention that Aber is really, really great at proxy-based and computing. And so he took uh, their experimental data where they ran cells in hypoxic and normoxic conditions and measured their motility and found some of the differences in motility between the two populations and then imposed that upon uh, the, the cells in the calibration process. Uh, and so then we added this, this variable we talked about of uh, the duration of the hypoxic response or the persistence time. And so when the persistence was zero, so without any persistence that you know, once a cell leaves its um, hypoxic conditions, it resumes its normal behavior. And, you know, in retrospect, it should have been pretty obvious, I guess, that, you know, if you put these rules on that the cells never really escape a tumor, they just move far enough to escape hypoxia. And in fact, we found, you know, that, um, that basically we can model these indefinitely. You get this concentric ring structure where the red cells would be, uh, you know, normoxic, the green cells would flee just long enough to flee the hypoxic zone and then stop migrating. And so they form this nice little neat concentric green ring just behind the red edge. And you know, if the tumor grows a little bit more, well then the basically the edge of the safe zone moves. So the green cells move just a little bit more and they can just keep pace. So without phenotypic persistence, you just can't get invasion. But if you now turn on phenotypic persistence, anything basically greater than zero and the greater the zero, the greater the, uh, the invasion, uh, you get really fascinating behavior that uh, not only do they break out, but they form structures in the rim that uh, you would not have seen if you had not been tracking them as specifically as green cells, uh, like in the experimental system. And if you kind of zoom in, they basically form a hypoxic plume where some of the green cells will stochastically find a mechanical weak spot in the tissue and push through. And then that becomes mechanically favorable for other green cells to follow behind. And so to the, you know, if you're just looking at it uh, without a model underneath it, this looks a lot like collective migration. They move as a mass and, and kind of move together and get out of the tissue. But it turns out that it's completely individualistic, that you can get the emergence of things that look like collective migration just by the stochastic processes and every cell being out for itself. So that was actually quite interesting. Well, it got more interesting. So here's an animation where you can see uh, the green cells, red cells transition to green, kind of go through orange, and then become green, then tunneling out and form these hypoxic plumes. We showed this to our collaborators, to, to Danielle, and they were really excited because they had actually seen these structures in mice. And so without really even knowing that, just putting in really basic models, these green structures emerged. And uh, that was the first time that with this all kind of came together. And I think it's a really nice way to show kind of a, a marriage between uh, computational biology and experimental biology, that you have a novel experimental system that allows you to see new structures for the first time. Without this green permanent switch in the color, you wouldn't have seen these plumes experimentally because these would have become red again. They would have been said, you know, they would not be hypoxic anymore. So these structures are invisible without this novel experimental marker. And then the computational model that says, let's simulate this process uh, allows us to predict the emergence of these structures. And then by comparing and saying, these are the minimal set of rules it takes to make these structures. So you don't need collective migration, you can form plumes and it just, it just pops out. So experiments show something for the first time to make the invisible visible. And mathematics says, now can we explain the things we saw the first time? 
like to point out that if you run the same model in 3D, so like, for example, simulate like a core section through a 3D tumor, uh, they also get this behavior. So the, uh, you know, not all 2D predictors always hold out in 3D, so it's good to double check. And uh, you can actually try this model yourself also online. Uh, and this paper was actually just recently accepted into iScience. Uh, you can access the preprint while we kind of work through with the editors and get it online. Uh, but it should be popping up in iScience anytime now. Uh, so that kind of takes us through all the examples. I think it went a little faster than expected, but that means we do have lots of time for questions. Uh, and in part two of the talk, we're actually going to do some modeling tutorials. We're going to play with, uh, with some example models. And then we're actually going to build some ourselves with varying levels of, of difficulty, kind of showing you how you can do very basic modeling very easily. And now we have a, a graphical editor that actually lets you build some of these models without writing C++. And then if you want to do the really advanced models, then you still you know, do need to get your hands dirty and write C++, but you can get a, a lot farther than you used to. And uh, we'll introduce that in the second part. And then uh, I wanted to give a little plug that we have a, a virtual workshop next week. Now, applications are closed for the process, but uh, most of the sessions are going to be either live streamed or recorded and open to everyone. And we'll have a, a, a nice succession of tutorials to teach you how to use the code, uh, how to build things, um, and it should all be available. So uh, we would really love to see you there. And uh, we'll be sharing those with you as, as the materials come out. So I guess this would be a great time just to pull back and, and answer any questions. Thank you so much, Paul. Always just fantastic presentations. I learned so much. I haven't seen the iScience work, I think so, or maybe I have, but at a different point, and it's really, really beautiful, nice, nice um, uh, comparisons to data. So um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. And of course, we have some more time, like you said. So if people have other maybe more technical questions, which might um, come up again in the afternoon, um, you can ask Paul now as well. Um, Anna um, said, first, beautiful simulations. I agree. Um, she, uh, uh, she was wondering how you parameterize these models and how many parameters are free versus determined with the data. Okay, so that is a really great question. And, you know, a lot of times with an agent-based model, you run into these problems, right? And so what we try to do is we constrain it as much as we can. Uh, there are a lot of parameters that are just basic physics, right? And also, I guess, let's take one step back. One thing we've learned from physics is often not the specific values of parameters, but the balance of them that really matters in driving a system. And so if you can estimate most of your processes to order of magnitude, it turns out you can actually get pretty far. So things like oxygen uh, in cell proliferation, cell sizes, uh, when we don't have specific data, we at least estimate them to order of magnitude uh, and then kind of go from there. And so uh, one thing you can do that's a little bit more detailed is you can, um, of course, run parameter sensitivity investigations. And this is something that's increasingly possible with high throughput computing uh, to really say, you know, I have all these parameters, but which ones really matter in driving this system? And so you can see which parameters are most, most sensitive, and that's maybe where you want to, to kind of spend your time working and getting data. Um, we do have techniques to particular focus on how you calibrate cell proliferation and death that we've, we actually uh, worked out way back when it used to be in Dundee. Uh, so we have a method paper on that, on how to basically take a coarse graining of your method and match the proliferation and death characteristics. And then you can calibrate and constrain mechanics to maintain uh, cell densities that you measure in tissues. So there's a lot you can already constrain. There are some free parameters. I don't think I can actually give you very easily a number because it'll vary with what you're trying to model and what you've put into your model. But we try to keep things as constrained as possible. And you know, the other thing I'd like to point out that this is a platform for like computational thought experiments. And you know, we have to decide what your real goal is. Is your goal to perfectly recapitulate a mouse, or is your goal to come up with a hypothesis for human health? And so quantitatively predicting what happens in mouse is a wonderful exercise, but quantitatively matching a mouse means that you've predicted a mouse, uh, but the mouse itself is a model of the human. So you're talking about a model of a model. Uh, but what we really, really want to look at is, is qualitative things that pop up that give you insight not on the mouse, but on the human. And so you say, you know, uh, is strategy A better than strategy B in the simulation model? You know, that's a qualitative hypothesis that you can very easily check uh, in, a, say, a mouse model or in a clinical model and say, well, did therapy A really work better than therapy B? Can you maintain relative rankings? So you, you have to phrase the right questions where you become a little bit less sensitive to specific parameterization. On the other hand, you know, Morgan and Adrienne in particular have really proven that you can do a wonderful, amazing job of parameterization 
uh, that uh, means it can really hold these models to a very high standard. Uh, and that to me has just been very inspiring to see. Well, same here. Um, should I read the questions off the chat window or do you want to keep moderating them, uh, Morgan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll um, I'll read them out just in case um, for any reason if someone doesn't have a chat open. Um, oh, and also because we're recording it, so then people will know. Um, mm -hmm. So Lizette uh, asks, uh, well said, really interesting, Paul. Can you please say something more about the options for boundary conditions on the computational domains? Oh, thank you. And first of all, Lisette, your work has inspired me for years and years and years. Uh, yours was actually the very, you know, remember that that fun workshop we had in uh, in the in like the valley when I was still a graduate student. You guys, you and Amy showed me some of the first agent models I've ever seen, and they were just so inspiring. And you guys did all the immune work and like, oh my God, that's so complex, I never want to touch it. So it's taken me like 15 years to get over that and finally enter immunology. Uh, so I, I really appreciate that because um, you're like a hero to me on this. Um, for boundary conditions, we have, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, for diffusing substrates, we have two options right now. You can do Neumann or zero flux conditions, or you can do Dirichlet conditions. And we have developed a capability where you can actually specify those conditions on a boundary by boundary basis. So you don't have to have the same condition everywhere. Uh, the other thing you do is you can actually approximate uh, boundary conditions for more complex domains by basically you can take voxels within your simulation domain and say, I'm going to declare that to be a Dirichlet node or voxel and impose the solution values there. So it'll basically it approximates uh, Dirichlet conditions on an irregular domain inside of your simulation. So that's something you can do in the diffusion side. Um, you can do that on a substrate by substrate basis, on a boundary by boundary basis, and also these interior nodes. For the cells, uh, that's where things get very interesting for the boundary conditions. This is you know, back when it was just myself coding for fun, um, whenever the tumor hit the boundary, that meant my simulation was done. So my clue that the simulation was done uh, was that I get a seg fault because it sold off the domain. Now that's acceptable for a single person working together and not really acceptable for a framework. Uh, so more recently, we've been adding new options on the cell boundaries. Uh, one thing you'll see this afternoon is we added an option for a virtual wall, which is very similar to Cicely's uh, uh, work this morning where we basically use potential functions applied along the wall to give a strong restorative uh, resistant force for cells can't penetrate that computational boundary. They basically get pushed back inside. So that's one possibility. Um, another possibility I want to do a little bit better in future releases is to say that maybe a cell living in the domain is just removed altogether, but that also can have its own impact. Uh, another option would be to maybe somehow kind of collect the cells that leave and have them you know, influence it kind of in an ODE uh, non-spatial basis, but that would take, I think, some community development, but it, there's a lot to think about there. We have thought about wrapped boundary conditions, but honestly, tissues aren't toruses, so I've never found it very physical or compelling to, to implement wrapped or reflecting boundary conditions like that, so we have not focused on developing it. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Well, uh, Lizette can let us know. I think I hope it did. Um, oh, yes, thank you. That was a terrific answer. Thanks so much, Paul. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lisa. Um, Tatiana asked the question about specific papers, and I wonder if that might be a better question to answer in the Google Doc, um, because then um, people will have a, a hard copy of it. But maybe you could just briefly mention um, what the papers are where you look at proliferation and death rate parameterization and refining and matching. Yeah. Uh you know what? So my, you know, before we went open source, we wrote a method paper in the Journal of, Theor Journal of Theoretical Biology on uh, agent-based modeling of ductal carcinoma in situ. So that was the first one where we looked at parameterization methods using basically coarse graining. Um, so that's in Journal of Theoretical Biology. Oh man, I don't remember what year, like 2010 or 11 or so. Uh, I'll post a link into it in the chat, into the Google document. The second paper, we actually refined that just a little bit more by uh, accounting for some of the discrepancies between the model and the way immunostains actually work. Like the, the key immunostain for, for proliferation uh, in pathology tends to be KI67. And it turns out that that stains not just cells that are about to cycle, kind of like mathematicians want to assume, but cells that have just finished dividing, but they still have a little bit of residual protein. And those stain positive too. And if you don't account for that, you're actually gonna be off in your calibration. And so we wrote a very small letter to the editor to follow up on that, also in JTB, 
Uh, that was actually my first paper that was uh, driven by a, an undergraduate researcher. So that was really exciting. Um, more recent papers, uh, the physical cell method paper uh, also kind of tried to pin down at least order of magnitude of parameters, although really relying upon that original GCIS paper uh, primarily. Uh, but if you look at the supplementary material, which is actually longer than the paper itself, uh, you'll see a lot of work at trying to calibrate and constrain the parameters. And then, of course, on a project by project basis, we, we keep working on that. This question of labels, I think, is super interesting because um, in, in my PhD, I worked on neutrophil lifespans and models of neutrophil um, production because it's important for cancer therapy. And um, there, there's a lot of labeling that's done within the bone marrow. And also there are different ways to do this labeling, like heavy water or, you know, deuterium. And, mm -hmm. like, um, and the question of how label, not just how do you model label as it comes out, like in KI67, but what is being labeled and how the label degrades. I think that's just a fascinating, and it's really interesting that you can think about that in an agent-based way as well. So, oh, yeah. Like, like these Fushi systems, right? Where they, they light up in different phases of the cycle. I think it'd be great to just to model how they really appear and then perform, you know, basically do your exact same, you know, bioinformatic workflow on the simulation model and see what you, and there at least you really know the true ground truth which is a great way to kind of assess these, these computational and experimental and bioinformatic methods. It's a really fun problem. The other thing is I remember getting into debates with biologists about how long apoptosis takes. And uh, for very good reasons, I had a biologist I talked to who was convinced of biology that apoptosis is like a 15 minute process. And that was because in the tissue she looked at, if she ever stained for a dead cell, it would be gone after 15 minutes. But what happens to an apoptotic cell? It, shrivels up and it gets less adherent. And so in your tissue processing, uh, you basically wash them all away and you lose them all. So you drastically undercount apoptotic cells in, in most image processing and analysis if you're not really careful. Because really, if you actually do an experiment that's designed to look at apoptotic cells, they take you know six, seven, eight hours to get the job done, not 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but depending upon how you process your tissue, you, you just lose them all. So I think you know that to me is still a huge concern. And like, Cleave caspase 3 only catches part of the death cascade. Caspase 8 only gets part of the cascade. Tunnel assay only gets part of the cascade. So I think all of our standard measurement techniques are actually undercounting them. And yeah. that's still bugs me. Um, sorry, I interrupted you. I, I was just going to say, I totally agree. And I think that in part of your, the last part of your talk, you were saying that, you know, quantitative approaches are really there to like understand, you know, here is some observation and they can help in a complementary way to understand. They're not just, like you said, a model of a model. They're there for a biological. And Heiko was talking about this yesterday too. Like, you know, everything's a model and yeah. we just have to accept like what the limitations are of any structure that we're using to model. But, you know, mathematical models and mouse models and animal, you know, human animal models are all models. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, uh, there are, like I said, it, it would probably be a good idea to write down those papers once you <laughs> can go through your Google Scholar um, <laughs> list to make sure you get the year right um, for um, people so that they can have a reference. And then uh, we're really looking forward to the tutorial this afternoon, which um, we've done before. And I, it's just great. So thank you so much for all of your resources and for this great talk. Oh, thank you. I'm just honored and delighted to be here.